Welcome to WBT Television. My name is Farooq Shah Khan. Silicon Valley Innovation Institute organizes a monthly meeting of Innovate, Innovation Society on every first Wednesday of the month. Check out their uh, website, svii.org, for more of the details on this meeting. Um, you're all welcome to join the society. Uh, this month, we got uh, a surprise, a presentation by Leonardo da Vinci on innovation. Uh, Professor Robert Horn of Stanford University teaches visual languages and how that applies to innovation. So let's watch it. So again, we are at the Silicon Valley Innovation Society meeting. This is November 5th. And um, our speaker tonight, I have to tell you, our speaker tonight has been scheduled to be uh, Robert Horn from Stanford to talk about visual language and how it affects innovation. I. Uh, Bob had to leave earlier. He had an emergency, and I'm um, sorry to say uh, that he's not going to be able to present, but he has sent someone in his stead. Um, he believes it will be a very extraordinary substitute we'll be happy with, um, and this speaker has actually an exhibit nearby at the Tech Museum in San Jose. Um, we have with us tonight Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Ah, you do know what it is. I may have invented it. I'm and you can do whatever you want with it. You can set it down, you can hold it, you can give it to me. I'm so happy that you could be here. I'm very sad that Bob had to leave, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie. <laughs> Leonardo Da Vinci. Il Florentino. The Florentine. You may think of me as a painter. I, I did paint some pretty important works. But actually, I spent most of my life as an innovator. And that's what I've been asked to talk to you tonight about. <coughs> I did my, I was, I did paint a good deal, well, 20 or 30 or 40 paintings. However, to earn my money, I was an engineer and an entertainer. An entertainer, you say? <laughs> yes, indeed. For 20 years, I worked for Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milano. <coughs> I put on his pageants, his extravaganzas, his parades. He needed to keep the people quiet and the elite <laughs> entertained. <laughs> but most of the time, well, in fact, you couldn't think of me. I put on so many uh, extravaganzas for Ludovico, the Duke that I could have been the Disney of my day. You can think of me as Leonardo D Disney, if you like. <laughs> However, um, most of my time was spent as an engineer. In fact, I was chief military engineer for five countries. Five countries. Um, we need a little Italian history here. Can I help you, Leo? Yes, that would be good because there is no ledge on these. Not really. A I would have put a ledge on them. You would have done a I would have designed a beautiful ledge. <laughs> <laughs> there was a ledge there, but it's a very bad design. Yeah. Putting the lesson. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about my life as I talk about innovation today. And you need to understand the geography of Italy at the time. Italy was actually divided into five countries at least five, actually more, but five that were very important. This was Napoli, the, run by the king of Napoli, of, of, Nap of Naples, as you call it these days. Then there were what were called the Papal States, headquartered in Rome. We had 
see the Republic of Siena, which was not very important. And what was very important was Florence. Right here. Da Vinci was 30 miles from Florence. Then we have, over here, the Republic of Venice, and here, the Duchy of Milano. Five countries. How many of you have, have been a chief engineer for five countries? I have, by the way, had some slides made for me, and I will make them work here with these marvelous buttons which I did not invent. So I have divided my talk into 11 lessons of Leonardo on innovation and visualization tonight. Lesson number one, have wild ideas. I had many wild ideas. I can tell you that. People will tell you that. For example, for Ludovico Sforza, I designed a tank. 400 years before <coughs> tanks were actually used in warfare. 400 years was my wild idea before it was actually manifested. How many of you innovators here have had ideas that were 400 years ahead of their time? <laughs> Everybody. Well, then I think if we have some extra paper, we should have people write down one of your wild ideas as I'm as I'm talking, and we will use them later. Oh, there's my tank. Actually, there's my tank. Uh, it was made of wood. Uh, there were there are people. In fact, at uh, at that exhibit down there in San Jose, there are people who allege that that. that other people had designed tanks ahead of mine, but none was so, so uh, adequate for the purposes. Although I have to tell you, I was a man of peace. I never saw a battle. I never participated in a battle. But you had to earn money, and the Dukes of Milano and the King of Napoli and the Popes and the doges of Venice were always at war with each other. It was the perfect power, balance of power situation. Sometimes the king of Napoli was with the Milanos. Sometimes the Venice was with the king, uh, the, the, the Pope. At the times, the Medici had formed alliances. It shifted many times during my, uh, my, my growing up. Could I have? Let me show you some of my other wild ideas. Besides a tank, of course, crossbows were used a great deal in, in my time. And this is a crossbow that I designed, but it was a very giant one. It was a wild idea. Look at this is a this is a person. And then if you wanted a crossbow to shoot many times, you needed to, to load it up here, and as the man walked, it would release uh, one shot after another. That was another one of my wild ideas. And then we had the machine gun, the first machine gun, I claim, as well. Multiple guns, multiple guns in, a, in, in a row uh, that would shoot very, uh, very uh, strongly. And of course, as you all know, I invented the flying machine as well, the first the flying machine. And a helicopter. And, and of course, if you have a helicopter or a flying machine, it doesn't work very well, you have to invent a parachute <laughs> as well. So this is my parachute. They actually, the British broadcasting system actually built one and, uh, and dropped a man off of a mountain and it worked. So I'm very pleased with it. So, and bridges, military bridges, which you had to build very quickly 
and, and they had to be very light. And here is my military bridge. Okay, uh, before we get to my second lesson, I want you all to take your piece of paper and write your wild idea on it. Let's take one moment to write your wild idea. Leonardo's lesson is have many ideas. Lots of, now we've just had 30 or 40 ideas right here now, which is a very important thing. I, of course, had many ideas. Here's another one. This is what this I call my, my infantry sharpener. Um, these are very large blades that are drawn uh, by a horse. And, well, they shorten infantry. infantry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was this? Again, many of these things were never built, but, uh, but I uh, intended for them to be, uh, to at least to be, to be looked at. I actually did 14,000 pages of notes. About half of them have been lost. And of course, I can't show you them all tonight because uh, even if we looked at each one for a minute, 60 minutes divided by 7,000, 116 hours it would take. And I don't think we have the time for that. But I will show you a few other of my um, ideas. If you, are, if you are a military engineer, you know that soldiers have to march a great deal. And drummers get very tired. Their arms get very tired. So I invented an automatic drummer. This is the drum part. <laughs> and through a clever set of wheels, I have the, oh, the drum beat at a regular uh, pace. One of the things about big ideas is that that they um, do get the attention of uh, your client. And clients, I think, are important to, to, to several of you. I, I assume that some of you, some of you, in fact, work for other, for, cli for clients. Is that true? Can I see a hand raised? Yes. Ah, many people write for, uh, work for clients. Well, I had to work for clients, too, as I've told you, five different countries. Um, and to get my uh, to, to get the, uh, the 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 notion of big ideas across, I um, of course had to write a proposal. Do you write proposals in these days? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> well, perhaps you'd like to 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 hear part of a proposal that I wrote that I got my first big engineering job from the uh, uh, from uh, the Duke of Milano. Here it is. It was two pages long. Most illustrious lord. <laughs> we had boilerplate in those days, too. <laughs> That's kind of problem. Wrong introduction. Yeah, wrong introduction. <laughs> Having now sufficiently seen and considered the proofs of all those who count themselves masters and inventors of instruments of war, and finding that their invention and use of said instruments does not differ in any respect from those in common practice, that is, the competition stinks, right? <laughs> I, I, I am emboldened, without prejudice, to anyone else to put myself in communication with your excellency in order to acquaint you with my secrets. Intellectual property, you know. Uh, thereafter offering myself, at, at your pleasure, effectually to demonstrate any, at any convenient time, all those matters which in part are briefly recorded below. I'll do a demo any place, any time. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, I have plans for bridges. You've just seen some. Very light and very strong and suitable for carrying very easily. Two, when a place is besieged, I know how to cut off water from the trenches and how to construct an infinite number of scaling ladders and other instruments. Number four, I have plans for making cannon very convenient and easy to transport, of which to hurl small stones in the manner of almost hail. Number five, and if it should happen that the engagement is at sea, I have plans for constructing many engines most suitable for attack or defense and ships which can resist fire of all the heaviest cannon and powder and smoke. I 
I was a kind of one-man DARPA, you see. <laughs> Six. <laughs> also, I have ways of arriving at certain fixed spots by caverns and secret winding passages made without any noise, even though it may be necessary to pass underneath trenches and a river. Seven. The proposals get long, as you know. Also, I can make covered cars safe and unassailable. That's my tank. Which will enter the serried ranks of the enemy with artillery, and there is no company of man at arms so great as not to be broken by it. And behind these, inf the infantry will be able to follow quite unharmed and without opposition. Eight. Also, if the need arise, I can make cannon, mortars, and light ordnance of very beautiful and useful shapes, quite different from those in common use. How many of you have used the word beautiful in a proposal? <laughs> <laughs> Where it is not possible, nine, where it is not possible to employ cannon, I can supply catapults, traps, and other engines of wonderful efficacy, not in general use. In short, as the variety of circumstances shall necessitate, I can supply an infinite number of different engines of attack and defense. Ten, in time of peace, I believe I can give you as complete a satisfaction as anyone else in architecture in the constructing of buildings, public and private, and in conducting water from one place to another, a very important thing in my day. Oh, also, I can execute sculpture in marble, bronze, and clay, and also painting, in which my work will stand comparison with that of anyone else, whoever he might be. Moreover, I would undertake the work of the bronze horse, which I'll tell you about a little bit later, which shall endure with the immortal glory and eternal honor of the auspicious memory of the prince, your father, and of the illustrious house of Sforza. And if any of the aforesaid things should seem impossible or impracticable to anyone, I offer myself as ready to make a trial of them in your park or whatever place shall please your excellency to whom I commend myself with all possible humility. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> so that, is, that was my proposal uh, to think big. Uh, one of the things that I did then was, in fact, so there are my cannons. There is a cannon factory, because sometimes you, you couldn't rely on anyone else. And after all, what is a Renaissance man if you can't build a factory, too? <laughs> and my bicycle. You may have seen pictures. And some of the ships aforementioned. A compass, a lantern, and a plow. However, my third lesson is to think not only wild, not only many thoughts, but big. I offered to build, to make a sculpture of the largest horse that would have ever been sculpted before. You can now see it in San Jose at the Tech Museum. It is 23 feet high, 70 tons of bronze. I spent several years on it, eight years to be exact. It was a, there was a considerable problem with it. I wanted to have the prince with the rearing up horse, but with 70 tons of, of metal, you couldn't support it on just a couple of legs. Even, the, even if I had put the uh, uh, tail down and, and, and put a rock there under the tail. Uh, in the end, I had to uh, uh, design it in a, in a fashion like this where all the uh, feet are on the, on the ground. Uh, if you go to the Tech Museum, you'll see that you are about this high. The next thing was, 
how to, I wanted to have a horse that did not have those ugly seams because all the sculptors before me, when they had done large bronze, welded, made, piece, made them in pieces and welded them together. And the ugly seams were not uh, adequate to, to, to my aesthetic. So I wanted to mold the horse in one piece. Of course, of course the prince would be a separate, would be put on afterward. It took me several years to figure out how to do that. And it presented a lot of different problems. But that's what you have to do when thinking big gives you a whole set of, of, of issues and problems that enable you to invent other things. It was a, it was a large engineering problem um, to, to, to mold it all in one piece. And I figured we could dig a pit uh, and lay the horse a, a upside down and pour the molten brass, 70 tons of it, in through the legs. But that was a problem because Milano is built on a marsh. And when you dig down far enough, you hit water. So I had to then redesign the whole thing and lay the horse on its side and pour the, the, the brass in at, at very inconvenient spots. But nevertheless, we thought it would work. I made a 26-foot plaster model of the horse. It was about after about eight years or so that I was in that I was in Milan. Uh, but just at that time, Ludovico Sforza was now in battle with the French. We're up here, and they were marching in through his duchy. And he had to take all of the brass, the 70 tons of brass that we'd accumulated for the horse, to make cannons out of. And so I never got to actually create the model of my horse. And when the French, who actually won that war, came into Milan, they used my horse for crossbow practice. And it was completely destroyed. But I had other big thoughts. For example, when I was working for the Medici in Florence, Florence is inland, and its port is Pisa, here, Leaning Tower Place, you know. Um, and uh, Pisa, every so often, would rebel. Big problem for the Medici. So they came to me, as they often did. I will use this one here. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're trying to we're trying to beat the uh, the Pisans, Pisans, and uh, here is Florence, here is Pisa. What should we do? Can we use some of your new engineering instruments? And being a man of peace, I said to them, I have an idea. You know, the Pisans use the river Arno, which flows from the mountains past Florence. It kind of comes down like this to Pisa. They use it for their drinking water. What I can do with my specialty in water uh, engineering is to divert the river so that it goes around here and ends up in a new port. Now there's a big idea. There's a very big idea. We actually at one point started to, uh, to, to dig such a uh, diversion, but as usual, politics shifted so quickly in, in Florence that um, we, couldn't, we didn't need to do it. Here are the actual maps that I, that I drew. Here is, here is my map of the um, Here's the, my map of the, the River Arno. Here's Pisa over here, Florence over here, and here's my plan. I designed castles of all kinds. Uh, it was one of my military specialties. Now, my fourth lesson is fail early and often. Now, I was, 
I was really quite good at that. I probably had more failures than, any, than anybody else up to that time and perhaps after. You know, if you had, if you had an Olympic competition in failures, I might still be competing. <laughs> I might be still the record holder. Do. Uh, I will tell you only about one of my failures, one of the things that was, that was not um, uh, built. This was when I was in Venice after working for uh, the Duke of Milano for 20 years. At that time, I should mention that besides all the warring states here, there were the Turks. The Turks were always at war with the Venetians. And at the time that I visited Venice, the Turkish Navy was in the harbor of Venice. Big ships, many, many, many of them. And the council and the doge asked me to come and make suggestions. And I said to them, I have an invention, an innovation in naval warfare. I have designed a snorkel-like device which you place over your warrior's face and with a large tube that goes up to a float on top of the water. Looks like this. Uh, my drawings here uh, from my notebooks. Um, here is a, a man with it. Uh, here's a little detail of his face. That was an early drawing. We, that one we didn't use. And this was the most sophisticated one. And what would they do? Why would, why would you want a snorkel like that? Well, you would have the warriors walk on the bottom of the lagoon or the harbor there and walk underneath the ships and drill holes in the wooden ships. I invented Navy SEALs. <laughs> but they didn't do that either. I was at it, I, in, I in also invented lifesavers. <laughs> now, the next lesson, Leonardo's lesson number five, is observe nature. I was born out of wedlock. I was a bastard, as it was said in those days. A single parent family, as you would call it today. <laughs> but that was, and that meant that I could not go to a regular school. Maybe that happens to some of your children too. But for me, it meant that I could, I was not taught Latin or Greek, which were the languages in which all the books were printed. So I couldn't read the books most of the books. A few were written, like Dante's Inferno had been written uh, 50 years or so before me, and Goodwin was written in Italian. But most books were had been, uh, the, the ancient books and the current books were written in Latin and Greek, and I could not read them because I was only sent to school a few, uh, a few days. But this was an advantage, as it turns out. It was an advantage because I had to then go look at nature look at it very carefully, experiment, try things over and over again, do it systematically. Sounds like science, doesn't it? Uh, it was a very important thing because I found out that many of the old books were wrong. I mean, they were filled with theories with no observation. A, a great deal of my work was thus based on that. And I will only give you one example. I studied birds. I thought that was the way. I was so interested in, in, to, in being able to fly. I spent months and months in the study of birds to see how to make a flying machine. I studied their anatomy. I studied the comparative anatomy of, of human beings to see with, whether we had strong enough muscles in the way that birds had them. I really did the very first comparative anatomy of, of, uh, of birds and humans. These are some of the drawings that I made of uh, various flying machines. This guy here is pedaling around here and also uh, 
making, uh, adding the strength of his arms to make these flapping things work. Well, that one didn't work, as, as neither did my other flying machines. Here's an example of one of the wings, another one here of the, of the person flying here, and the pulley arrangements, which I was very good at. I was very good at pulleys and gears. Uh, the model that was, that was made of one of my uh, flying machines didn't work. The British uh, broadcasting system actually did a program on me, and they built one of my flying machines, and it crashed. <laughs> but my glider, shown here, worked. And it was like a hang, it was what you would call a hang glider now. Now, you came in part because uh, the people uh, advertised that, uh, that a young man named uh, Robert Horn was going to be here to talk about visualization. Uh, and he's written a book, which uh, is over there on the table, that uh, uh, illustrates some of the ideas that I knew very well. And I will illustrate them from, from my work. One of the things that he says in that book, which I think is a quite a good book, um, is that, that you need to put the, the words and the visual elements very tightly together, unlike what usually happens in most of the kinds of publications that people do. The picture over here, lots of text over here referring to the picture. So you have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and back and forth and back and forth in order to understand the thing. No, I already knew that. And, and you will see many, many examples of it in my, in my uh, manuscript. Here's the, here's the cover of his book. He loaned me this slide. And the idea, basically the idea is, his idea is that there is a grammar of words, images and shapes that all work very, very closely. The tight integration itself is what creates visual language. And these can be in different proportions at different times depending on the subject matter. And he has a couple of very interesting chapters on that which he calls functional semantics. A new term to me. Where he looks at uh, about 20 different ways of, of expressing things like what are things, how do things work, and so forth, um, and uh, presents the various proportions and rules that work with images and words. Now, shapes, of course, we use. I was a student of geometry, a very, uh, and I was very fascinated with geometry. I thought it would integrate everything that we did. Um, but to a large degree, we hadn't invented diagramming at that time. It was very, it's very strange to me and really quite remarkable to see that diagrams uh, are, so, uh, are so needed these days. There is, besides the kind of tight integration I just mentioned, that, that there are a variety of vocabularies from all these different fields which are coming together in a very natural way that are also than producing visual language. Reasons for visual language, he, he asserts, is the, of the, the complexity of our day. There is no way that prose running down a page by itself can anywhere near handle the complexity of our day. Now, I know there are some writers here for various kinds of publications in the audience, people who have written books. And I don't mean to insult you, but the, the future of explaining complexity lies in certain kinds of diagrams. This is a diagram, I'm told, of what we know of what are called the metabolic pathways. And I'm very interested, I was very interested in, in uh, anatomy in my day. This explains how your body uses energy. And, and, and I'm told it was it's the work of some 20,000 biologists over 40 years in, or, in order to uh, show each of the chemical changes um, in the body. And, if, and, and I think that that's what is needed for the kinds of problems that, are, that you are facing today, the large, what you call systemic problems, social systemic problems. 
Uh, and if you think this is complex, that's only the top half of the diagram. <laughs> so part, a, a good bit of my work uh, was, of my visual work was addressed at, at anatomy. I, I uh, dissected 30 cadavers in my day. How many of you could have dissected a cadaver? Mm -hmm. Three, three of you, wonderful. My early anatomical drawing precise for another 200 years, I'm told. Part of that was because I never got to publish my, my book on anatomy. I was doing, well, as you can see, so many other things. Here are some other examples. of my visualizations. I, in, I invented uh, ways of portraying uh, the, in, in medical illustration uh, oh, um, not, pre not precise um, representations, but representations that would bring out what, uh, what you needed to know anatomically. Because if you were just looking at this and dissecting it, it would be very hard to see all of the, uh, the detail that I portray here. Everything can be designed. Now we're back to my, we're back to my horse again. Here's, a, here's an actual picture of the horse. Well, I've told you, I've told you most of the story about the horse. Uh, what, what, what I haven't told you was that I had to design a whole uh, mechanism for uh, getting 70 tons of, of uh, brass to be molten all at the same time. I had to have a way of, you see horses like this are, are about uh, two fingers, for, for artists, about two fingers thick in brass. So all the way around here is two fingers. Uh, so you have to make also an interior mold of the horse. Which is a very difficult, um, which is a very difficult thing to do because it has to be braced internally. Seventy tons of, of brass is a is quite a quite a hard thing to uh, to do. But I figured it out. One of Leonardo's lessons, number eight, is empower innovation. Now here I'm speaking to you um, to you bosses. We called you dukes in my, in my day, or. The more common name is dictators. Um, <laughs> the most important lesson that I have for you is to tell your innovators what you need and go away. I was very fortunate that the Duke of Milan, Ludovico, was always going away to fight his battles so I could work on my innovations at the pace that I wanted to work on them. And that's why the, uh, the, the, the great uh, painting that I did, The Last Supper, took so long. I'll tell you the two reasons why innovation sometimes takes a bit of time. This is how my predecessors painted The Lord's Supper. Look at them sitting there stiffly like, like statues or something. What I wanted to do was to have the dynamism of a dramatic moment in my painting and to have all of the emotion that occurred in that dramatic moment portrayed the Lord suffered to look like this at the time when Jesus announced that someone in the room would betray him. The most dramatic moment in that uh, event. And here are all the different disciples reacting. Well, one had to, I had to give the disciples personalities. And it took a while to walk around the streets of Florence to find the right model for the different disciples. Look at how individualistic they are. Ah, Judas. It took me 
It took me eight months to find the right face for Judas. Another lesson which I think you have already learned to a large degree is make rapid prototypes. Rapid prototypes um, are very important, but, but, but they are, um, they were difficult for me to make. And the reason was, you have to understand my psychology, as soon as I figured out something, I wanted to move on to the next thing. I didn't really want to build it. I didn't really want to do it. I was really interested in moving on to the next thing. So have to understand that that may happen with some of your um, innovators. There, there is something called a Renaissance man, and I was sometimes thought of as the prototype for a Renaissance man. How do you, how do you become a Renaissance man? I was very fortunate. As I mentioned, I did not get an education, so I was apprenticed at 12 years old to Verrocchio, the most famous sculptor in Florence. My father, who was a lawyer, knew Verrocchio, and he, at once he had seen me do some drawings, he, he uh, apprenticed me to Verrocchio. Now, workshops in those days were really artisans' kinds of factories. We used all the different disciplines to make sculpture, architecture, jewelry, painting. We had to mix our own painting. We had to know the chemistry and physics of architecture and the engineer. Verrocchio's workshop, where our first project when I was 12, was to put a very large brass, uh, copper ball right on the top of this large dome, of, of Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. Uh, there you can see a little bit better the picture of the, of the ball. Now, people are about this high, so you can see it's a very large, it's a very large object to get all the way up there. <laughs> I have some. So we had to, first of all, do the metallurgy for the, for the copper, the welding to put the various pieces of the ball together. We then had to build the scaffolding, and because it was heavy, the cranes that would lift it up there. It was a gigantic task to put all of that together. That was my first lesson in the need for all of these different skills. I think today that you who are fostering innovation need to think about putting together Renaissance teams. My last lesson is maintaining focus. I stayed on the track in painting the Mona Lisa. It took three years. Why did it take three years? Because, again, I wanted to invent a whole new way of painting, which we called SFUMO, which stands for, which is translated uh, as smoke in, into English. SFUMO meant that the edges of, of the figures were very soft. They did not have hard edges like the drawings that I made, you know, they were very soft. In order to do that, I had to invent a whole method of, of, of painting. The way I figured out to do it is to paint very, very, very thin layers of, of um, transparent, almost transparent paint. And of course it had to dry. So that's why it took, that's why it took so long. Now I'm not going to, even in the question and answer period, tell you who the Mona Lisa was. That's just off. And by the way, also, um, I'm not going to comment on the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> uh, those are my lessons on innovation. And I hope you were not too disappointed that Mr. Horn could not appear tonight. Thank you very much. Very happy to entertain your questions. Who were your metallurgists that you collaborated with? <sighs> My
my memory is very um, faint on that. You know, memories fade over four or five hundred years. So I'm afraid I can't really answer that question. Yes, sir. There, yes. Was it many years between when you were thought to be insane and then became thought to be a genius? <laughs> Hundreds of years. <laughs> Actually, I was very secret about it. And so people thought of me as just a courtier. I, I had a beautiful voice, and I sang for the court. And people uh, enjoyed themselves very much. And of course, they liked my entertainments. Yes, sir? It seems like like your career focused on perhaps two big chunks of, of developments. One is quantitative hard engineering yes. designs, like catapults and helicopters. Yep. And the other is more purely artistic, like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. When you were when you're working on these areas, did you find it more useful to work in parallel and to jump back and forth? Or to spend a year or two focused on one type, like the quantitative side, and then shift over? Well, if, uh, if my uh, clients let me alone, I would work in parallel. I would, uh, I would go out and observe the birds in the morning. I would, go, I would paint in the afternoon. I might go and, 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 and dissect cadavers by candlelight. I would study, I studied my birds for, for, for several months at a time. Uh, I studied my geometry uh, and invented uh, and did the illustrations actually for a great mathematician. Book, uh, a bit of, at a time, as well. it took me several months to do the illustrations. All right, thank you very much. Oh, one more. They're back here. Well, we we're all wondering, did you invent the internet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, but I think it is. <laughs> oh, I think it is a marvelous tool, <laughs> and I got all my slides from that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One more round of applause, please. Just one more applause. Thank you. <laughs>